Hello and welcome to another episode of Naked Truths. In this episode, we are going to be chatting to Rachel Bean, who is a registered veterinary nurse and a tutor of first aid for your dog. Now, Rachel has a wonderful course online and Rachel teaches across, well, across the UK. I was going to say globally, actually. I'm not sure if you have stepped across Oh, yeah, Rachel, to, to teach, uh, yeah, to teach first aid. So you can tell us all about that, actually. Um, in fact, come off it. I do know that you've, you've uh, taught first aid over in Thailand because this is where we headed off together. Um, and uh, you were teaching first aid over there to uh, the Soy Dog Foundation. Soy Dog Foundation. Yeah. 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 So I thought what would be really wonderful for all naked dog customers is to give all of you a chance to learn first aid for your dog because I think it's invaluable. It really is invaluable now. So many more of us have dogs and I think incidents and so much more is happening. It's a very busy world now, Rachel, isn't it? We're not, you know, we're not blessed really generally with huge fields with only our dog running around in it. So there's so many more chances for things to occur and situations to occur. Such a busy world now. So I think it's great really that people like you are offering first aid courses for dogs. So first of all, can you tell us why it is that you feel that first aid should be taught by a registered veterinary nurse or, or a veterinary professional? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about is, is the subject of first aid because um, I kind of live it every day. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm doing it every day when I'm at work because I am in, um, still in practice um, 26 years now, in my 26th year of being in practice. So, yeah, um, if I, you know, if I haven't seen it, then, <laughs> yeah, over and over again. So I think I think when we see accidents, it's one of those things, isn't it, that you think it'll never happen to me. Oh, my dog doesn't do that. My dog doesn't run in the road. My dog doesn't jump, you know, over a fence and injure itself. My dog doesn't fall in the water. Um, one day it might. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's, um, you know, that's evident by the accidents we get in. You know, we get these accidents in daily. It just happens, you know. Um, so I think if owners have got that first, you know, humans with human first aid, they've got like gold, that golden hour, haven't they, where um, it's really critical that you do something that's potentially going to save that person's life. That's exactly the same with dogs, you know, just down to the simple things like knowing if the dog's heart stopped, knowing the type of breathing that it's doing um gum color what does the gum color indicate does it indicate the dog's losing blood or losing oxygen just the simple things how to stop an arterial bleed um if we can do these simple things it's potentially life-saving you know i'd i just posted something yesterday from from um somebody that had been on one of my courses um and she's got an elderly dog um bless him he's 16 um and he had a seizure um a few days ago and as far as she was concerned, he was clinically dead. Um, his eyes were glazed over, he'd stopped breathing, he'd stopped, his heart had stopped, um, and she did CPR and kept, because the, the essential thing with CPR is keeping the brain oxygenated. So she knew to do the breathing and kept, did CPR. And it was actually 20 minutes, I think, by the time she got to the vet, um, and she had to wait another 20 minutes when she was in the vet. And the vet came out and said, he's fine, <laughs> he's, 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 he's awake, he's looking around. Um, and when without a doubt, the vet said to her, your CPR skills saved that dog's life. Um, wow. Yeah, you know, we get these and I get these feedback stories weekly, you know. So it does, uh, for me, it, it, it is life saving. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, especially in that incident. Although CPR for dogs, it sounds like something you might not actually want to do. Like, well, on, maybe we should start with something like bandaging a cut paw. Like, yeah. CPR sounds like a proper extreme thing to do for yeah. your dog, you know? I haven't, I, to be honest, I don't know if I'd even considered if I would get down and start doing CPR to Fusa before. She, especially, she, you know, she's, yeah, I, don't, I just can't imagine that I'd thought to do yeah, that. I go to that dog owner. <laughs> yeah, but I think if you're in that situation, it's your dog, then, yeah. you know, instead of panicking, um, you know, um, somebody told me, it was actually somebody from the mountain rescue said, um, you only panic when you don't have the knowledge. 
So if you've got a clear thought about what CPR is and, and the simple steps, then you're more likely to do it rather than panic and think, oh, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, the dog's like not breathing. Yeah, so because this girl knew what to do, it was easier for her, even though she was still obviously distressed because it was her dog, but she wasn't panicking. She didn't go into that fight or flight herself, which if you do, if you go into fight or flight yourself and you, you don't make sensible decisions going forward but because she had a kind of a plan in her head about CPR she could do it and and it'd be successful yeah 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 wow so I'm guessing that isn't such a common feedback um you'd be surprised I, I certainly get more from people that are working with dogs because they're you know groomers doggy daycare dog walkers dog boarders because they've got a high volume of dogs um going through their hands so um but yeah with with pet owners um yes it occasionally happens but it tends to be the cup feet is 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 a common one torn nails um you know lameness lumps and bumps yeah 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 and I'm guessing incidents where maybe one dog has bitten another or yeah, something. Yeah, dog, dog, dog bites. Yeah, I mean, dog bites, you've got to treat very, very carefully. Yeah, because they can infect really, really quickly. And, and cases of sepsis um, happen very quickly as well. Yeah. Okay, so if that sort of thing happens, I mean, what's your top tip for people to do? Um, yeah, I mean... Top of the list is don't panic. <laughs> um, but if you've got if you've got a severe bleed, um, any any open wound, um, and if it's whether it's arterial or um, like a venous bleed, you can certainly bleed to death from that. Um, if it's arterial, it will tell you if it's arterial because it will be um, a high volume of blood um, coming out at high speed, usually spurting or within with a pulse. Um, it'll be frothy, it'll be bright red. With that, you need to, any bleeding, really, you've got to stop it. And that's the first thing uh, in any incident is to stop bleeding. Because if they're bleeding, they're losing oxygen. And then if they lose oxygen, then they're going to pass out, yeah, and, and have shock, hypovolemic shock. So that's blood loss, shock due to blood loss, oxygen loss, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think in this incident, we're, you know, we've sort of launched into the scary things, haven't we, really? But, you know, in this instance, we're talking a lot of blood loss. If your dog has cut their leg or ripped their gene claw, this is common, mm -hmm. isn't it? So this sort of thing where, you know, it might look worse than it actually is, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, but what yeah. could people maybe do then? Yeah, I think I think the main thing is to once you've um, sort of stemmed the bleeding is to cover it. So just put a nice simple bandage on. If it's if it's bleeding a lot, then you need to put like a very a very tight bandage on. So it's like a compression bandage. But for just normal bleeds that you think, oh, it's not it's not life threatening. Just a normal um, two layer bandage um, that would be in your first aid kit. Um, I wouldn't worry about washing it cleaning it or anything like that or putting any um sort of ointments on i think i think we see this a lot on facebook or social media where they've got a small graze or a small cut and then it's what can i put on it and you get lots of ideas you know all these salves and ointments and tinctures and but if it's something minor you know that the, the body will heal itself you know it's got a healing process um, about three weeks something like that so sometimes if it's minor then we just leave it to nature you know if we get a scratch we don't put loads of things on it to make it heal quicker mm. uh, heal, making things heal quicker can be detrimental to, to good healing because it has a process so sometimes mm. we can go a little bit over the top with some minor things yeah. mm. well I think the thing is we do worry because there's an element of they're not a human so there's an element of we don't understand them, but I think I find that often with nutrition as well, that there are more correlations than we maybe believe as a, as a, as a dog guardian. And, and actually, when we actually stop and think about this, a lot of things are functioning in the same way as, as if you found, um, you know, your child would cut their knee. For instance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, a grazed knee, we wouldn't, with a child, we might put a little bit of cream on to help, you know, the child emotionally with that, but we certainly wouldn't be putting lots of things on it and lots of uh, tinctures. We just let it do its, do its thing and, and heal naturally, yeah, yeah. So tell people a little bit more about the sorts of things that you can teach them. Yeah, I, I mean, when I do my face-to-face -face courses, I don't... Um, that particular course, I don't actually do um, PowerPoint because I like to have smaller groups um, be, and we're around a table with me at one end teaching out of a workbook that's with a pen and a workbook and missing words and missing phrases. So they actually have to engage uh, mm -hmm. 
have to interact and we do discuss things because usually even if we've got dog owners they've the experience at being dog owners so they've got stories to share they've got questions to ask i think if you're in front of um people at the front with a powerpoint to this particular subject um people are less likely to put the hand up and you know but if we're around a table it's much easier then to have a quick conversation and i tend to i talk about and teach all the common first aid scenarios. So everything from bees and wasps things to, to snake bites, adder bites, to hypo and hyperthermia, all types of types of shock. Um, uh, what else? Um, cuts, what, what type of cuts? So from incisions, lacerations, what the differences are, um, poisonings as well. So we get a lot of those accidental poisonings at work. So what to keep away from the dogs as, as in sort of your medications and plants and um, chocolate and uh, raisins and all that kind of, we've already had our mince pies in already. So <laughs> don't touch your mince pies, yeah. So, so what, what I like to do is give the people a bit more. I mean, a lot of dog professionals say they're first aid trained, but they might have only gone to a basic one. I try and give a lot more in depth because of my experience in veterinary practice. Um, I can give a lot more information and a lot more realistic um, overview of, of what does happen and what can happen. Um, mm -hmm. And now actually working with um, IPET Network, we can offer an off-call level three qualification in canine first aid as well. So especially for the vet, you know, pet, vet, pet professionals, being taught by a vet professional is, is the way to go. Um, because you know you get you get a much fuller picture and much more information um, given. Yeah, and they can do, yeah, as I say, they can do a level three qualification now as well. Okay, so that's more for the pet professionals rather than the pet guardians as such, isn't it? The off qualities, yeah, but it's actually the same material. Um, I teach exactly the same material to the pet owners. Um, yeah, um, and it's tailored then. The discussions are tailored, so I will talk about whatever they want to talk about. You know, if they want to do more in depth about wasp stings, then I can do. You know, it's uh, it, that's where it's not structured in a way that I cannot say, oh, we'll spend 10 minutes on this because you've asked that question. I don't say, oh, I've got to move on quickly. Sorry, I've got to move on quickly. It's, you know, I will I will tailor it to what everybody wants to discuss. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so this time of year, you've mentioned the mince pies already. Yeah. Give us a few hints and tips. What can people take away from listening to your talk today that's going to make sure prevention is better than cure? that their dog doesn't end up in a first aid situation? Yeah, we've got a few things. So main thing um, is the changes at Christmas. We put Christmas decorations out. Um, they can be um, lethal if dogs and cats eat um, Christmas decorations. We have that. Um, tinsel tea seems to be a, a popular one with cats for some reason. Okay. Um, yeah, um, chocolates, when chocolates are on the tree, um, the dogs like to pinch those when presents are under the tree. So we've got selection boxes, um, even tins of sweets where you think the dog will not open them, they will open them. <laughs> they'll find a way. Yeah, they'll find a way. And um, chocolate ingestion is really common over Christmas. We get a lot of chocolate ingestion, yeah. Um, and the other thing as well is be careful with your feed is make sure that you don't suddenly give the dog um, a different meal that's uh, high in fat because of pancreatitis. We do get a lot of cases of pancreatitis in over Christmas. Um, Interesting, acute, acute pancreatitis. Yeah, acute pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. another, another reason for pancreatitis as well is, you know, when you put the fat balls out for the birds um, and they fall and, uh, on your grass and then your dog goes out and eats them, especially those um, Labradors. <laughs> yeah, they go yeah. I like eat three or four um, fat balls for the birds, and then that's that's a big, big trigger for an acute pancreatitis. Mm. That's yeah, definitely relevant this time of year because we really want to support our wildlife. Yeah, the other, the other one to watch for in the winter months as well is your antifreeze. Um, so antifreeze is in um, it's in a few things actually. So screen wash, mm. it's also in um, the radiator fluid. So if you're changing your radiator fluid from summer. Uh, fluid to winter fluid which is your um, antifreeze if you leave it somewhere in a bowl because you've emptied it it's very attractive to animals because it smells sweet and it is sweet to taste so they don't actually need to drink very much just a few laps will actually damage 
the fine tubes to the kidneys so that then they have an acute kidney failure yeah and it's 99.9 percent .9 lethal yeah and the ingredient is ethylene glycol um so yeah keep that well out of the way and also um if the grit has been out as well and then there's a bit of a thaw you've got wet roads or puddles in the road don't let your dogs drink out of puddles in the side of the road because there's a chance that there's ethylene glycol in, in the fluid there in the side of the road and also wash your dog's feet when you get back if it's, if it's been walking in the in the grit yeah out the gritter yeah uh, that's brilliant tip brilliant tip yeah because i don't suppose all of us think about that if we sort of rush off to walk our dog we don't necessarily notice always what it is that the dog might have walked through on the walk yeah, so the symptoms of that are they're just the same as kidney failure, really. So the dog um, or the cat will be off colour um, and latter stages will be vomiting, diarrhoea and just feeling really well. It's just kidney failure, basically. Yeah. You mentioned shock a bit earlier. Hmm. Now, I remember back from my talent and tea touch training days, we used to talk about the shock point on the ear and we used to discuss how we could very mindfully yeah. stroke the dog's ears in those situations. Is that still something you'd say to do? Yeah, I mean, we can do that. Um, the shock that I was on about really is more the hypovolemic shock, so it's blood loss shock. Okay. Lock, last, you know, loss of oxygen, really. But yeah, if a dog's panicking, it's slightly different. Um, so yeah, you can do the ear slides. And um, the, what, I, what I use a lot in, in work, I certainly use the ear slides, but um, also the little pressure point there. Um, I forgot what it's called, but it's a little pressure point there. It's an acupuncture pressure point. And I kind of massage it then, put a little pressure on it. Mm -hmm. and you know, with some dogs, it really calms them down. You know, for when we're taking bloods and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm usually at the front end doing doing this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's called something. I can't remember what, it, what it's called. I'll, I'll look it up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, doke. Oh, no, that's, that's, oh, it's lots of useful stuff that, that you're sharing. So people can find your online course, obviously yeah. we'll give the website and you've mentioned that you work in small groups as well. Are you still running those workshops now? With the yeah, web? Are, yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got two left um, for this year and then dates are coming in thick and fast. So I'm actually gonna post um, later on today, um, January and February's dates, yeah. So they're scattered all over the UK and they will be th throughout the year, yeah. Okay. So it'll be a mix of, um, um, you know, pet people and pet professions can come along as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's geared to everybody, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so whereabouts can we find information about? Yeah, uh, my website, um, well, my, my website is probably, um, probably my Facebook page, actually, is probably better. So it's um, Canine First Aid Workshops, Rachel Bean, RVN. Yeah. Okay, is that, is that K9 or is that? The full word, the full word. Full word. Right. Okay. Brilliant. And I'll, I'll put the link on there for the um, online course as well. Yeah. Yeah. When we post this, we'll do that actually. Yeah. So there's a direct link through. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about some of the dogs that you know that you've been able to help. Um, oh, just trying to think what we've had this week or last week. Um, well, I mean, as a result of learning first aid. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of... Ones that seem to be quite prominent is um, choking incidents. Um, so it tends to be quite dramatic when a dog is choking. So um, it's really critical that owners know how to deal with that. And usually if they do, then it's usually a success story. And the choking ones tend to come through quite um, quite quickly actually, actually as, a, as a testimonial. Um, so probably maybe I get two or three a month where people have message me or put a post on Facebook and tag me where they've saved the dog from choking on a, on a chew item um, or a ball or something like that yeah so that's why you know when, when we're natural feeding as well it's it's really important to stay with the dog if you're giving them chew items yeah because yeah, yeah I mean this is a massive thing. thing yeah it's it's I'm guessing really understanding the difference between raw meaty bow being, bone being gulped down as it should be to something actually being stuck and choking occurring yeah yeah, yeah. and there's you know there's some things you can do if it um if we're talking about sort of balls and things like that it's really important to, to play with size appropriate toys um the the most common one that we see is that hard rubber ball it's just marginally smaller than a tennis ball um mm -hmm. and for anything over so sort of my size dogs so at 25 kilos, mine are quite small Labradors. When you get like big retrievers, you get a big male retriever that's like 35 kilos. 
the tennis ball, although even a tennis ball, that hard rubber ball is going to be too small because their throats are really, all dogs' throats are really flexible. So that ball is, is too small. All you need to do is throw it. And if the dog jumps up at the right angle, it just goes whoop, straight down and lodges in the back of the throat. Yeah. So play with size appropriate toys. Balls with ropes on is better, um, but good quality ones, not the cheap ones that you get at the, you know, cheap um, sort of stores and things like that. Um, it has to be good quality rubber ball with a hole in the middle where the rope goes through the middle. So if you do have an incident, at least, and um, you've got some way of pulling, pulling it back out. Okay. Yeah, well, you wouldn't even think of that, would you, when you were looking through the dog's toys? You wouldn't think, oh, let's buy something that will allow for air to circulate should they choke on it. <laughs> So yeah, it's really useful information. You know, whether we're all going to remember it, I don't know. We'll have to be making notes of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so you've taught abroad, haven't you? you? You've gone out and taken your workshop. Yeah. I mentioned, I forgot, but then remembered about the Thailand uh, workshop. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Thailand. Um, so before COVID, I've been. I mean, we went five years ago, didn't we? Six years ago, maybe. I don't know now because I look at my dog and I think, hmm, how long have I had to you? Because she obviously was from there. Yeah, so I've been going sort of two or three times a year for the last six years before COVID. Um, and every time I, I was getting opportunities to teach something, yeah. And then um, two year, for two years before COVID, I was going to India as well. Um, so I've been teaching in India and in Bangalore and, and um, a few other places at shelters. Um, and then I had a couple of weeks in Cyprus, so I taught there. And then the plan was to actually go to New Orleans. Um, I've got a friend there that's got some big um, dog projects going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I was due there, but couldn't go because of COVID. And then I was due to go to Beijing, um, just as COVID hit. So that's been hopefully postponed, but we'll, we'll have to just see. Yeah, so uh, yes. The rescues, you're going over to shelters. Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's such amazing work. Yes, I enjoy it because it's it's challenging as well. You know, obviously there's there's the, the language barrier. The the shelters in India, um, the staff just had absolutely zero English. Um, so we had to use interpreters. And but yeah, it was, I've got some great videos of us teaching CPR, and they really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I recall actually from that that workshop in Thailand was um, you bandaging a tail, mm. and you were showing the staff how to get this bandage to stay on because obviously when you bandage your tail the first thing they do is wipe their tail it yeah. can fly off so just tell people a bit more about that yeah so you just bandage it um, i mean usually tail injuries are what we call happy tail so it's where they've banged the end of the tail it splits the flesh um and you just get this constant battle of trying to get it to heal i mean yeah. in some cases if it's really bad we do have to amputate quite you know a bit further up to to get rid of that damaged end but if it's um if it's a cut or, or um, um sort of some some hair ripped off if they've been through brambles or whatever if they've got long hair um what you can do is just put your normal bandage on and then the secret is to keep it on if you use elastoplast so you've got your let's say this is the tail you've got your bandage on this is the body up here and you just use your elastoplast around push some hair over it and then another round of elastoplast some more hair and around some more hair do that three or four times and that would that will keep the bandage on yeah okay so it's sort of using the hair as an anchor in a way yeah yeah, yeah. that's a really good thing with that yeah yeah, that always looks awful. When, when I was in kennels many years ago, I remember going in one morning and thinking, wow, what's gone on here? And then you realise there's this tiny little cut at the tip of the tail, but the blood is literally yeah. just lying out the tail. Yeah, it's the same with ears as well. We had a spaniel in last week that um, it, 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 it'd been in a, I think he was just playing rough with another dog and it literally it was the tiniest nick on the end of his ear. And he was a bit stressed that we couldn't get a bandage on it because he was too stressed. And that's actually uh, another reason with puppies and young dogs is to get them practice getting bandages on. Uh, mm -hmm. And the um, collars that you have to use for operations, get them on when the puppies so they get used to it. Because this, unfortunately, the spaniel was, was bleeding, but, you know, it was only a little nick. But every time we put a bandage on, he was just super stressed and he was just... It was more stressful for him having the bandage on than actually having the bleeding ear because he was just getting his feet in it and just ripping it off you know it was just and um, we were just stuck then i just had to do um sort of street dog style and and just tape it on just the ear itself and i don't know how long it lasted but um 
Yeah, and it, it's really difficult, especially when you've got a client in the room trying to get a bandage on a stressed dog, you know, because it, it's really difficult because you feel for the dog and oh, we've got to get the blood stopped. Um, but yeah, the room, literally, the consulting room was just like, just sprayed everywhere, right on the ceiling and everything. So I'm glad it wasn't my job to clean that. <laughs> <laughs> Delegate. <laughs> it was everywhere, yeah. And we had it, we had it all over ourselves like this, yeah, yeah. I think also maybe maybe one of the last things we should mention. You you did say that top tip really don't panic. When yeah. Panic. yeah. But I also think maybe second to that is really respect the dog because in yeah. that incident, you didn't make the dog have that bandage on. No, no. You watched their body language. And I think that's that's an important factor to take into consideration because even our own dogs, we may not have seen them as scared as they might be when they're in pain. And we may not be understanding why they're doing the behaviours that they're doing in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, talk about that just, just for a little bit. Yeah, I think, I think, I mean, it's difficult to know if you've already got an adult dog or you've got a rescue dog or something like that. But if, you know, if we've got a young puppy, we can prepare them for those type of incidences. Because I think there's a bit of a thing at the moment where, um, where we're, we've got to be quite hands off with the dog. We're not allowed to restrain the dog or do things that the dog might not like. But if we prepare them for it, it's a lot, it's a lot easier. If we do, if we do lots of hands off stuff when, when the puppy's little, like, you know, then suddenly 18 months and need a, um, a bandage on or, or a cone because they've been spayed or neutered. Um, then, then they panic because they're not used to having any pressure on them. You know, so I think it still is really important that puppies are handled correctly and they're held still and released and held still and released. So, so they learn that a little bit of pressure or confinement or restraint or a bandage on them is not scary because it, it, it tips them into panic if you just put some kind of restraint on them, um, you know, like a bandage, because it, it kind of, it triggers their panic and flight response, doesn't it? If they've got one limb that's that's got a tight bandage on it, it then triggers them into, into um, um, flight behavior or, or fight behavior, yeah. So I think I think sometimes this hands-off approach can be can be a bit detrimental. Um, I think it's really important that they learn to be restrained um, and gently held. And yeah, yeah. So if over Christmas someone feels that their dog has had too many mince pies, mm. <laughs> is there anything they could do at home to encourage the dog to perhaps bring those back up and not um, the neck? Well, yeah, it's it's a difficult one because it should always be done. Yeah, uh, it should it, it shouldn't matter what time of day it is. You always have access to a veterinary number to call somebody. You're registered with a vet. That means that you've got um, an out of hours. That means there's a there's a vet on the other end of the phone that you can ring and speak to me directly. If they give you instructions to make the dog vomit, then that's fine. Um, because there's some things that we simply don't want the dog to vomit back up, you know, because um, it's unsafe. So the vet has to make that, yeah, the vet has to make that decision. It's one of those things you see a lot on on social media. My dog has eaten something and then you get 30 40 people telling them how to make the dog vomit saying oh the dog will be fine and all this it's very irresponsible um you know to say that in a dog that they don't know um so always always ring the vet and that's why it's really important that you have all your vet's details up to date if you've not used your out of hours vet for a couple of years and you suddenly ring them in a panic and you, the number that you think it was and that number's obsolete it adds to the panic so i always advise people every three or four months is just ring your normal vet out of hours listen to the voicemail and and make a note of the forwarding numbers so you've always got it as as, as a valid number yeah absolutely it's not as easy as 999 is it no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okie doke well this has been fascinating thank you yeah i've got some um the other thing you might need as well is first aid kits so oh, I have, yeah, yeah i have designed oh, i sense christmas present territory yeah. <laughs> These are my own design. So um, yeah, it's a handy bag. What's packed in them? What I try and do with mine is to um, have things that are useful. So what's in mine is um, quite a lot of bandages. 
So because if you've got a 30 kilo Labrador and it's cut its foot really badly, you're going to need more than more than one set of bandage. And quite often in first aid kits, there's one set of bandage and lots of other things that you don't necessarily need. Um, but these, it's packed full of bandages. There's tourniquet there and um, uh, foil blanket, eye washes, tweezers for pulling thorns out, all kinds of things, really. Um, I do have a small one. This is great for staying in the car or, or your house or back of your, you know, in the boot of your car. I do one that's small and it's kind of that size. Um, and that's an emergency bleed kit. You can attach it to your um, belt when you're walking or put it in a rucksack when you're walking. And what that's got in is the dye emergency. So it's got one foot bandage, tourniquet, fall blanket, and a bottle of um, clotted, which is the coagulant um, for uh, serious bleeds. Yeah, arterial bleeds. I mean, arterial bleeds will always need some kind of support from hand pressure as well. But um, this stuff's actually come from the American military. Um, so you can use it on people as well. The, the powder reacts with the blood and, and helps it clot. Yeah. So. Yeah, so these are um, these are 38. The smaller ones are 30, which include a bigger bottle of clotty, actually. I mean, the big bottles of these are 19.99 anyway. And these little baby, baby ones are 9.99. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh they sound good. Great. Well, really handy to have. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okie doke. All right. So, um, as I said, we are going to put Rachel's website um and i think it was your facebook wasn't it rachel that you wanted to put up so we will put that link up for you all yeah. and um yeah and, and and you may be interested in uh, the online course that yeah. rachel has for. If, you, if you if you still uh, are someone who would rather stay at home and learn online yeah. learning has become easier than yeah. ever hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's self-led as well, so you can stop and start it whenever you want. There's no time limit on it, so you could buy it now and start it in six months' time. It's not a problem. Um, and each lecture is locked as well, so you can't actually skip through them. Um, you have to read it and look at There's lots of videos, real footage videos, nothing nothing drastic, just educational um, videos. Um, and there's, there's over 200 multiple choice questions as well, so it just checks what you've, what you've learnt. Um, yeah, so yeah, you'll find it interesting. Yeah. yeah. Nothing gory. Nothing really gory. <laughs> okay. All right, then. Well, thank you so much for being here. And if you have any questions for Rachel, do post them in the comments below. So both of us will be able to see those and uh, we'll be able to support you and answer those questions as best we can. I will tag you, Rachel, if you happen to miss them. And yeah, we can go from there. So fantastic. Thank you. Great information. And um, I will see you on the next episode of Naked Truths. Thanks for watching.